Hey, Acryptisans. Tonight's show, Alameda to repay Voyager, SEC sues Ian Bellina, and Treasury defends Tornado Cash Sanction. It's 10 p.m. Pacific time. The date is September 20th, 2022. Welcome back to the Crypto Overnighter. My name is Nicodemus, and I'll be your host. The cover model, mascot, and co-host for this podcast is Tex, and together, we take a nightly look at the crypto, NFT, and metaverse space and the industry that surrounds it. If you have questions or comments on the show, come find us on Twitter or email us at nick at cryptoovernighter.com. And keep in mind, nothing in this show should ever be considered financial advice. Alameda Research, they said that they're happy to repay their loan, and I'm going to bet that they certainly are. I'll get to that in a minute. So Alameda apparently borrowed nearly $380 million in cryptocurrency, and that's important for this story. So they borrowed that nearly $380 million in cryptocurrency from Voyager Digital. According to a filing with the Bankruptcy Court of Southern District of New York, an agreement has been reached between Alameda and Voyager. Alameda is due to return around 6,553 Bitcoin and 51,000 Ethereum. All of this is scheduled to happen by September 30th. That's just over a year from when the funds were borrowed in September 2021. And we'll get back to that in a minute. Now, back in July, Alameda signaled that they were ready to return the funds. On July 7th, they tweeted out, quote, Happy to return the Voyager loan and get our collateral back whenever works for Voyager. That would mean Voyager would have to return collateral. 4.65 million FTX tokens and over 63 million serum. Roughly $160 million. Now this was after Voyager first started to get in trouble. Back in June, Alameda offered a bailout to the tune of $500 million. Voyager rejected that offer, saying that it would harm their customers. They said the offer was, quote, a low-ball bid dressed up as a white knight rescue. Well, they would come out way ahead on this one. And here's what I mean. Alameda took out a loan from Voyager. They took that loan denominated in cryptocurrency. This was in September of 2021. Think about the market back then. One year ago today... Bitcoin was in the 39,500 range. Today, it's struggling to stay above 19K. So it costs less to buy those 6,500 Bitcoin and the 51,000 Ethereum today than it was worth a year ago, which is a pretty good improvement on their position in a bull market. Makes absolute sense why Alameda was announcing on Twitter that they were ready to pay their loan back. And no big surprise why Voyager put that off for as long as possible. I imagine they'd like to put off being repaid for a while longer now. Because the crypto they're getting paid back today is at a discount compared to when they lent it out. $380 million loan, they're going to be able to pay back with $200 million in crypto. Now at present, we're waiting for the 29th of September. That's when there will be another hearing to determine the results of the auction for Voyager Digital's assets. At the time of writing, the global crypto market cap is $928 billion. That's down 1.54%. The top five cryptos by market cap are Bitcoin down 3.17%, Ethereum down 3.87%, Tether, USDC, and Binance Coin down 1.02%. Shots fired. Securities Exchange Commission Chair Gary Gensler has introduced an interesting legal concept when it comes to jurisdiction. This came from a federal lawsuit that the SEC filed on Monday. They filed this suit against Ian Bellina and they said that he failed to register a cryptocurrency as a security before launching an initial coin offering back in 2018. And at first, it seems like a typical suit. 
The SEC has filed more than a few of these. They said that Belina didn't file a registration statement before selling Sparkster tokens and that that token was not exempt from registration. Now, Sparkster promised a no-code software development platform, and you'd get access to the platform by using Spark tokens. It promised users with minimal technical skill that they'd be able to develop software. And in the suit, the SEC is asking for, quote, injunctive relief, disgorgement, civil penalties, and other appropriate and necessary equitable relief. Now, if he is found guilty, that means Bellina won't be able to promote securities again, ever. Now, Bellina, for his part, is not taking this lying down. He told his Twitter followers that he was, quote, excited to take this public. And he continued saying, this frivolous SEC charge sets a bad precedent for the entire crypto industry. If investing in a private sale with a discount is a crime, the entire crypto VC space is in trouble. But that's not the interesting thing. If you just stopped here, it would be a semi-interesting story about a crypto influencer finding themselves in hot water, deservedly or not. Where it turns interesting is when they start to talk about Ethereum. You see, the donations to take part in the ICO were made in Ethereum. So the Securities Exchange Commission is pressing an unprecedented claim. And frankly, I'm thinking it might be unsubstantiated as well. Because they're trying to claim jurisdiction over Ethereum transactions. Now, how did they come to this conclusion? It's because ETH nodes are, quote, clustered more densely in the U.S. than any other country on the planet. So the SEC went through the logs. And they're claiming that U.S.-based investors took part in Bellina's ICO, and they sent Ethereum to the investing pool. And then those contributions were validated by nodes on Ethereum. And because the Ethereum blockchain nodes are, quote, clustered more densely in the United States than any other country, in the SEC's point of view, quote, those transactions took place in the United States. Now, is this going to stand up in court? I don't know. I wouldn't think so. I never heard of any kind of precedent of this type, but I'm not a lawyer. For what it's worth, Ethernodes says that roughly 43% of all Ethereum nodes are in the United States. Now, what I'm thinking is this is an attempt at expanding authority through administrative ruling. Here's the deal. It's a U.S. defendant. Blina's in the United States. The SEC is a U.S. plaintiff. The U.S. investors sent their transactions to a U.S. defendant and a U.S. destination. What does Ethereum have to do with anything? If this transaction ha happened over Telegram, would the SEC then start to claim jurisdiction over all transactions that go through Western Union? I wouldn't think so. But it's clear that the SEC has Ethereum in their sights. Shortly after the merge completed, Chair Gensler was warning investors that crypto could be subject to securities laws. So he's saying that the fact that Ethereum's consensus is now settled by staking, that that might put Ethereum in the classification of security according to the Howey test. He said, quote, from the coin's perspective, that's another indication that under the Howey test, the investing public is anticipating profits based on the efforts of others. He said that providing rewards to users who stake rewards results in, quote, the investing public anticipating profits based on the efforts of others. He also talked about staking pools that offer staking services as a third party, that that's kind of sketchy too. He said it, quote, looks very similar with some changes of labeling to lending. Now remember, the SEC previously said that they didn't see Ethereum as a security. Both the SEC and the CFTC agreed that it was more like a commodity. It seems clear to me that the SEC's recent actions haven't necessarily been in the name of good stewardship of regulatory authority. Instead, it looks like Chair Gensler and the folks at the SEC are looking to expand their authority the way they have been doing lately. 
they just assume the SEC actually has the authority, and then they file suit. It seems like they're adopting a proceed-until-apprehended way of doing things. If this goes through, and if the SEC isn't stopped, we're in uncharted territory, at least as far as regulatory oversight over crypto goes. Because what's the difference between saying Ethereum transactions take place in the U.S., between saying that and that Ethereum is in the U.S., that it runs in the U.S.? It looks like they're trying to use a small-time lawsuit to set themselves up with precedent in future cases where the defendants have a lot more money to defend themselves, for example. This is why we need clear, full-on guidance. This is why we need legislation, meaningful, expansive legislation, so this kind of confusion doesn't happen in the future. The global NFT market cap is up 0.07%. Sales volume is down 5.67%. According to CoinMarketCap, the top five NFT collections by sales volume are Bored Apes, followed by Hutin Apes, Other Deed, Azuki, and Bored Ape Kennel Club. Now keep in mind, some of these collections have very volatile prices. So, do your own research. Elizabeth Rosenberg works for the U.S. Department of Treasury. Specifically, she is the Assistant Secretary for Terrorist Financing and Financial Crimes. And she is out here playing defense for the government and the way they handled and have been handling the tornado cash mess. Because she's suggesting that sanctioning cryptocurrency mixers could help with the government's response to foreign entities attempting to use cryptocurrency to sidestep U.S. laws. Now, Rosenberg was in a meeting with the Senate Banking Committee. Now, they were talking about sanctions on Russia. And that's when she said that Treasury adding mixers like Tornado Cash and Blender IO to the list of specially designated nationals, that it was a good thing. That it signals that the United States government was taking steps to prevent people from getting around sanctions. She said, quote, when sanctions can serve as a deterrent to any criminal that would seek to use a mixer in order to launder funds, that's an effective avenue we can use in order to signal that we cannot tolerate money laundering, whether that's for a Russian criminal actor, an Iranian, a North Korean, or wherever they may come from. And she added, Anonymity-enhancing technology, such as mixers, are indeed a concern for understanding the flow of illicit finance and getting after it. Now, Rosenberg was fielding questions from Senator Warren. Elizabeth Warren is known to be no friend of crypto. That's evident in her participation in this very conversation. Because she said that people in crypto were, quote, furious when uh, Treasury sanctioned Tornado Cash. And also... She was trying to say that Russian oligarchs could use crypto and digital assets to get around sanctioning efforts, which half of that is partially true. There are a number of people that feel that Treasury did overstep when they sanctioned a piece of code. Code is not one of the applicable targets of sanctioning. So, yes, people were critical of that. But Russian oligarchs using crypto to sidestep sanctions? That just doesn't make any sense. For one thing... The global crypto market cap is just below a trillion dollars for months now. If the oligarchs were indeed transferring their vast wealth into crypto, I don't think the price of crypto would be this depressed. Other recent targets of sanctioning by Treasury have included a Russian neo-Nazi paramilitary group and an Iranian ransomware group. And that's going to do it for us tonight. I want to thank you, my listeners, because... When you stop listening, I will stop talking. Take care of yourselves, but take care of each other too. We'll see you tomorrow night.